Good afternoon again, everyone. Um, I'm Doug Webster. I'm with CBRE Commercial Real Estate. Um, what Clark just described is real and is fake. Technology is there. It's the will of us to be able to make it all work correctly. So I want to take a few moments, though, and talk about some of our region's efforts that are already taking place and have already happened. We've talked about a number of people that have been involved from organizational positions, and you can see anywhere from 15 governments to six different transit agencies in the upstate, over 23 nonprofits and non-governmental organizations, educational institutions, the health systems, which is key, and over 75 private companies have been engaged in this effort all within the last year. It's a remarkable effort that's taken place in such a relatively short amount of time. And we've also mentioned all about the plans. And you know, it's interesting because it's really not fair in my, in my, in my opinion to lay blame at any of the planning organizations because many of them, from county planners to the MPOs, have restrictions that they have to live within and guidelines they have to follow in developing these trends plans. They're not allowed, for example, to look at innovative technologies and innovative transportation solutions that aren't currently deployed publicly. They're not allowed to look outside the boundaries of their jurisdiction. So how do you communicate, how do you develop a communication and a collaboration between Spark Road Planning and Greenville Planning and Greenwood and Anderson? It's hard to do when that's not allowed in your role. Some of the few ones that have gone beyond those boundaries have been the Piedmont Health Foundation Transportation Plan. And the transportation plan has just recently been finalized, it's not been distributed yet, by the PRT consulting firm out of Colorado to look at uh, automated transportation networks in various areas of the upstate. How do we connect our markets together? How do we connect our communities together and perhaps get vehicles and passengers and freight off the roads instead of having them being on the roads? These are all part of the long-term planning and thinking that we're trying to pull together through the leadership of Tenet and Top and all these different organizations. But rather than working to all about all the things that we've not been able to do, I think it's important that we also remember some of the recent wins, the things that have happened in our market that have made us somewhat unique in developing a lot of these transportation solutions and connectivity solutions. You know, in commercial real estate, we've all heard the term transportation-oriented development or TOD development. What we're seeing at CBRE and a lot of our forward-thinking research is that that's going to transition into connected-oriented development, where it's not just the transportation solutions that are part of the development, but it's the infrastructure that's connected to those transportation solutions that's going to be part of those developments. That, to me, is an exciting opportunity for us, and we're on the cusp of being able to do some of those things here in the upstate right now. But let's take a look at what's happened with our transit plans. Anderson Transit System has, expended, has extended their workforce development and service areas throughout their network. Clemson, Cat Bus, introduced the first all-electric bus system in Seneca a number of years ago. That was the first in the United States. They intend to continue to do that, and from my understanding, they're planning to have an entire electric fleet by 2023, so that's an aggressive position for them. Greenland, I agree, that's a long time. Greenwood has bought Proterra buses that are going to be delivered hopefully later this year. So our transit agencies are recognizing that there's a change in, among them that they need to address, and they're working hard to do that. But as we've said before, funding is an issue. Then we have the trails from Greenwood's West uh, Cambridge Trail to the Doodle Trail and Easley and Pickens to the Swamp Rabbit Trail and the Palmetto Trail. All these trails are now coming on place and into our industry and into our regions that we hadn't seen 10 years ago. And look at the economic development these trails have had on some of our communities, specifically towns such as Traveler's Rest. That's amazing. Our inland port is a feature that we forget about how important that's been for us. And thanks to the efforts of BMW and the State Department of Commerce and the, and the Ports Authority, that has extended our reach in the upstate to bring freight into our region and get it to the port. That's a major economic development, development driver for us. And then, of course, the innovation that we're seeing between Clemson and CUI Car 
and also Greenville Tech's Center for Manufacturing Innovation together, and our elementary schools like A.J. Wittenberg for engineering, the Finney Fisher School for middle school, and our upper, upper schools, all working hard to bring STEM education and STEAM education into our schools, which is a driver for our being able to maintain and keep talent here. And of course, the economic development aspect of all of this is really what the drive of this is. Some of these things that we've seen announced recently that I think are going to be important are the expansion of service with the GSP airport, for example, bringing Frontier Airlines in here. The smart green development that is being underway to try to develop over at, C over at uh, South Carolina Technology and Aviation Center, SCTAC, that is going to focus on how do you integrate innovative, connected technologies into cities' legacy infrastructure. How do you go to intelligent infrastructure after you've already spent millions and millions of dollars in the current legacy infrastructure that you have? You've got to be able to plan for it, you've got to be able to budget, and you've got to be able to know who the providers are that you want to partner in your community to make that happen. These are all innovative ideas that we're seeing happen right now in our area. But again, we all know that there are organizational challenges. A diversity of goals and objectives, but until now, I would say, no unified vision. Partly because of the restrictions that were placed on these different planning organizations, but also because it was not an area where we were all cross-communicating cross and collaborating as we are now. There's been a lot of time and effort spent to find a solution. And yet, little progress has been made, but progress has been made. And a lot of these organizations are taking among themselves from the nonprofits to the transit orient to the transit suppliers to make these things happen, even if it's done within their own little silo. So there has been progress made, but we still, that's just the beginning. And up until now, there's been very little coordination or communication between the groups. And actually, their missions overlap, and they ought to be talking with each other. They ought to be planning together. And they ought to be engaging the types of stakeholders, both public and private, that can make a difference in what we do. I'm excited about what's going on here. I appreciate you all being here tonight, or this afternoon. We are um, at the beginning of a journey that can have a significant impact on our region and really bring the upstate of South Carolina to a position of leadership in the country, in my opinion. So thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your time. <coughs> And now, I will turn it back over to the fabulous Stephen Sandler. So, let's begin this next round of questions with the following. Which of these do you believe is the big fix for our region? Think about that for a second. Is it A, a premium transit expansion? B, a new outer belt? C, comprehensive zoning? D, automated vehicle systems and personal rapid transit. Regional travel man management program, or F, none of the above. For those of you who aren't familiar with the travel man management program, let me describe it. It's essentially a program that effectively works with employers to say, let's create choices as to when shifts begin, when workers need to come and go, the days of week that they work staggering things so that the transportation system may not be stressed. So I don't want to place too much emphasis on that, but one of the following, select one. <coughs> this is one of those great moments, right? So I could ask this question and either get almost everyone to say it's none of the above, right? It's a combination of things. Or there's a really great idea there that we ought to do. And I think in large part what we're seeing is that, that there's a mixture of things that we know are likely going to be important to our future, and yet we're a little bit uncertain about how kind, what kind of an impact they're going to have. And that's all more of a reason for us to have some kind of coordinated strategy. So this next question, who's best positioned to represent our region's future mobility strategy? You can almost replace that word with responsibility, right? Is it A, a group of local governments? Is it B, the state DOT and our MPOs and RPOs? Is it C, nonprofits and foundations? D, institutions like education and healthcare? Or E, business and industry? You wish I could offer all the above, didn't 
you. You really do. I'm gonna make you choose. Let's take a look. So this is really interesting. This is one of the things that I mentioned earlier, that 20 years ago, right, we were almost exclusively only doing work for agencies, public agencies, whose job was mandated by the federal government. We're seeing more and more that industry not only wants a seat at the table, but needs a seat at the table. We're also recognizing that there's a variety of interest groups that are able to partner with groups to do research, to invest in innovation in ways that, as Doug described, really aren't possible through other public domains. And so that diversity is important. How well are these groups working together? So when you think about all those groups that I just mentioned, I want you to think about what you know not what you think or how you feel, what you know about how well the groups in the upstate are working together. A, really well. B, pretty good, but there's room for improvement. C, not well. D, I have no idea, but things are getting worse. I think there's enough enough expression there across the board to have a little bit of concern, right? As well as to see within those results some opportunities. In your opinion, what's it gonna to take to improve our region's mobility? Is it A, things need to get worse before we begin to change our ways? Is it B, we'll need to identify the silver bullet solution, that one big investment that's gonna make it better? Is it see a diversified and coordinated strategy with many investments? D, we've got great plans, we just need to identify more resources. Or E, patience, we should just wait to learn from other places that have greater resources. What say the upstate? Wow. You guys are finally in agreement on something. <laughs> With that, I'm going to transition now to Katie. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Katie Smith, and I'm with the Piedmont Health Foundation. And I'm going to leave since I'm not responsible for the. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting to see the level of responsibility, knowing how not many nonprofits and foundations are in the room, and how much we all want to work together. So I'm really excited about today. Many of us selected that we are on an unacceptable trajectory in terms of our mobility in the upstate. And what I want to talk about is what we heard from everybody, not just about that trajectory, but about where we're headed. What's interesting is so many different people representing different in industries and stakeholders participated in this process. And what I found noteworthy in participating is how people came from different perspectives, and you've heard that from our speakers up here that people are interested in the movement of freight, they're interested in their quality of life and not having a long commute, they're interested in air quality. But regardless, many of the solutions are the same, and the difference that we want to see happen is the same. The charge of connecting our future was to have a process that synthesizes all of these different goals and strategies and gives us a platform to act for the future. So I want to tell you what we've heard in this process. We had an advisory committee, as you heard, and you saw everybody stand up with lots of diverse stakeholders, and we really guided the process over the last nine months, and the charge of this committee was to provide some really deep insights to tackle these big questions. What are our greatest challenges specifically in this area? What are our expectations for the future, and what is our vision and purpose? We had really solid discussions, and what was really interesting to me was how it pointed to the unique needs of these different sectors, but really our interdependence. So as an example, we heard from manufacturers and those in freight and logistics talk about that they've got to move their stuff efficiently. They don't have time to wait in manufacturing facilities for things to arrive. And that all stems on how congested the roads are. Well, people who are interested in quality of life are also tired of sitting in traffic and nervous of being around box trucks in that. People who are interested in air quality don't need everyone to sit there, just like Clark Gillespie described. People who are interested in either training or hiring workforce representatives need people to get to jobs, whether they have a car or not. So all of us acknowledged, gosh, there's a lot of connection between us. What was great in having all of those sectors in the room together is it allowed us to really think outside of the box, to hear each other's perspectives, and to develop trust for the work ahead. Because I think a lot of times, if you've been in this work, you know, we get into discussion, and as we offer our solution, you're inclined to say, but, 
we need more transit. And someone else might say, but some people are going to want to drive their cars. But I'm concerned about this. This allowed us all to begin to say and, to realize these are all interconnected, and we're going to work together on it. So one of the first tasks of this committee was to develop shared expectations for this process, to kind of synthesize what we were interested in, talk about almost a value system for the work ahead. And there were six things that came out of this conversation. The first was a connected workforce, which is pretty obvious. We want to be able to connect people to jobs and get employers to bring people in to do that work. Another was sustainable development. What was really noteworthy about it is we're talking about sustainable development as a mobility tool. A lot of the folks that are interested in freight said, if people lived closer to the places they wanted to go, they would need to get on I-85, which would give me more of an ability to get my stuff to the site that I'm trying to get it to or from there. So by using land in a smart way, which is great for the environment, great for preserving rural areas, it helps with mobility. Enhanced livability, that's kind of an obvious. That's the thing that we all think about when we say we don't want to be Charlotte or Atlanta. It's about time out of the car with our families, being productive. Economic competitive, competitiveness has come up so much. We talk about how our vibrant area, our great workforce has contributed to all the growth that we've had in jobs. But if we don't deal with mobility, we're going to not attract new employers and we're going to lose some of the ones that we have. So we want to use mobility to maintain our competitiveness. Health and safety seems obvious, but it really needs to be a core value of what we do, both for the short term, that the ways we get around are safe for people, but for the long term, are we connecting people to healthy foods, to health care? Are we giving mobility options that let people get out and get active instead of sitting in their car? And expanded travel options. You've heard of some of those today, and I think if we all thought about it, we would not imagine 40 years from now to be one in which all of us sit in a car by ourselves going where we want to be. Surely the future has a more vibrant opportunity that helps us achieve all of these other goals. So that was kind of a core value of the work. So to really flesh it out, an idea exchange was held with more than 100 participants, again, from various areas, stakeholders, expertise. And folks kind of broke out into groups based on their particular area of expertise to give feedback on what were specific strategies that could be employed to help improve mobility in the upstate. It was a fascinating experience, and to me, the interconnectedness of all of this was really underscored. There were many, many strategies which our activity going forward will help us really identify what makes the most sense, and I know this might be a little bit difficult to read from your seat, but just a couple of examples in the area of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure to improve connectivity and invest in separate facilities just as one example, if we have got great bike and pedestrian infrastructure in our more dense areas, then kids can walk and bike to school and it takes minivans and suburbans off the road and lets people get to work more efficiently at 8 a.m. when elementary school starts. That's the interconnectedness. Commuter travel, investing in technology and alternative commute options, just as Stephen talked about, transit, transportation demand management helps us not even have to build a new road. If we can schedule when people get to work differently, we can thin out that stretch of I-85 from 3 to 6 p.m. as people are coming and going. Um, freight management, investing in the in inland port and better freight efficiencies. When I, I facilitated the freight table at the idea exchange because we were asked to do something we know nothing about, and as a social worker, I don't know much about freight management and logistics. What fascinated me was how all the folks who do work in that field mentioned solutions they wanted that I said, oh my gosh, yes, I want that too. We would like dedicated lanes just for our trucks to come and go. And I thought of all the times I've, my husband calls it a panic wall when you're against the truck and the wall, but how many times I've been in that position and how great that would be. Um, em embracing all, uh, emerging technology and innovation in technology, promoting transit supportive development patterns, looking at transit in all of its forms. Even though all of you here might not ride a bus, if you could get 40 people out of their cars and onto a bus, that helps you get around in your individual car if that's the way you choose to ride. Looking at connectivity and first and last mile solutions, even if folks do ride a bus, if they live two miles away from a bus stop, they're gonna need some other way to get there, whether it's bike and pet infrastructure, whether it's an automated electric vehicle that's smaller that can get into the neighborhood, and finally, looking at workforce access and thinking of all the options for workers who don't have vehicles. That's that group that Janice talked about. So all of these ideas have been collected and are going to be the platform for all of the work going forward.
but one of the most important products that came out of this work together was a vision to pull all of us together, because that is what we have really lacked. So let me share this with you. The vision for connecting our future and the work going forward is that the upstate will be a vibrant and connected region where transportation policy and investments promote innovation, sustainable development, and economic prosperity for all residents and businesses. I like to think that if we did a key poll vote on who can get behind that right now, we'd see 100%. Because I think that this is not just an exercise of great pros here. This really shows the interdependence of all of us here in the room, whatever seat that you're in, and gives us a path to go forward. Um, because if we want to connect our future, we really need to connect with each other and giving us a shared platform to get all of this done. So I really want to thank everyone who's been involved thus far, and I really want to encourage all of you to get involved because this is the way we are going to maintain this wonderful 10 county upstate region that we so enjoy and ensure its future prosperity. So with that, let me hand it over to Stephen to talk about achieving this vision.